hunt for Canada's best baseball prospect. Yes, folks, that's him. Olympian Desai Williams recalls his East York roots. And with Sunday's NHL preseason brawl, we take a look at fighting and its role in hockey. Welcome to Centennial Sports TV. I'm Isaac Awusu. And I'm Vinia Raimundo. Today's show is made in East York for East York. Let's get it started. Centennial men's and women's soccer team are headed in the opposite direction. The men continued their undefeated season this weekend as they picked up four of a possible six points, defeating La Cite 1-0 and tying Algonquin 1-1 to bring their record to 4-1 on the season. The women continued to struggle as they were held to a scoreless draw with La Cite, followed by an 8-0 thrashing by Algonquin, leaving them winless and in last place on the season. This past weekend at Rogers Center, 12 all-star teams featuring Canada's best baseball prospects, including some boys from here in the East End, took the field for a chance to show their stuff. Here's Justin Cuthbert with more. Prairie Brown, let's play ball. Events like the Blue Jays Tournament 12 will do well to help grow the game of baseball across Canada, but will give scouts the opportunity to find players from all across the country that might have otherwise gone unnoticed. It's, it's an amazing accomplishment just to have the opportunity to be in a tournament like this where you get the 220 best kids across Canada uh, to have, come here and showcase for all these scouts and, and colleges. It's, a, it's an incredible opportunity that seriously can't be uh, underappreciated. It's just an immense, immense chance. I expect the kids to come, come out here and uh play the game of baseball and uh, enjoy those, these four days that's going to be given to him an opportunity for them to show the, their skills. Uh, so how today go for you? Uh, I, thought I, I thought it went well. Uh, I just stuck to my abilities. I did what I had to do and uh, I felt really good. How's it feel to hit a couple home runs? Oh, uh, really good. <laughs> it was exciting to, uh, to play in this atmosphere and uh, to hit here. And uh, I didn't try too hard to do too much. I just stuck to what I know best. and. Keep my head on the ball, throw the barrel to center field, and uh, felt good. Uh, this is great for the baseball in Canada. Uh, I remember when I was their age at once, and I always wanted, wanted that, that opportunity to, to be seen by scouts from Major League Baseball from college, and hopefully uh, one of them can either make it to the professional level or, or go to college and get a degree. This is a great opportunity for some guys who might not have got seen. So that's what it's all about. There's some great talent, and, th and those guys are going to get seen, right? It's the guys who we wouldn't have seen who's going to get all the, uh, uh, the attention. I know a lot of scouts are going to be here, so I was mentally prepared for it, and uh, I was have fun. That's all I really need to do. Event coordinator and Blue Jays Hall of Famer Robbie Alomar believes the next Joey Votto, Brett Laurie, or Andrew Albers could be playing in the Dome this weekend. For Centennial Sports TV, I'm Justin Cuthbert. Ontario's Maroon Squad, which features a slew of East York talent, plays in the semifinal tonight. And now, we go to our dear friend Lanny Foster, who paid a visit to the community's young budding soccer stars in the Little Strikers program. We're here at Polson Pierce Soccer World, home of Little Strikers. And today, we're talking about the importance of fitness in our youth. Main responsibility is we brought the program in from Seattle. So we scouted a number of uh, soccer programs uh, in North America and we saw that this was the best program anywhere in North America for soccer for little kids. The main goal is to provide soccer for uh, families um, from the time that they're basically born to the time where they can't enjoy it anymore so we have programs here that basically run for people that are 70 years old type of thing right so uh, this particular program little strikers is an incredible program for 18 months and it goes right up to nine years old this is our first season um yes we, we chose this i'm a elementary phys ed teacher myself and i really like the program because they start with skill base and then they do a little bit of gameplay at the end the goal here for little strikers is teaching. It's, it's a child development program first, the soccer is second. So we start at 18 months, we're giving those kids a head start into school. So it's about learning first at their age, it's very age specific. Each class all the way up to nine years old is very age specific. 
just going to be a whole bunch of kids running around and more so than just kids playing soccer they're really emphasizing on you know the fitness aspect on and you know having proper um, proper values and you know making sure that they're healthy and, and, and the coaches are really having an importance about their their futures more so than just the actual day of the camp I mean obviously the, 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 having their feedback is you know so different but even I was just hanging out with a whole bunch of you know three years old and even though they can't really comprehend the rules of the sport it's still you know instilling the values of it's fun to work out or it's fun to run and I don't want to use the term work out but it's fun to be active sweating is, is good times and really having those values from yeah nine months old where moving is okay and moving is you know the preferred as opposed to just sitting down you can teach that any age all the way to you know to teenagers and on to adults. For Centennial Sports TV I'm Lanny Foster. Oh how cute this makes me want to pinch Vanilla's cheeks right there. Anyways most Canadians can recollect where they were for the 100 meter race in the 1988 Olympics. Well, today marks the 25th anniversary of the event, and the East York community has its own personal tie to it. Here's our reporter, Anson Henry, with the details. And it's a fair start. And it is Raymond Kerr with a start. It is Ben Johnson with a start. Can Kerr catch him? No, it's Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson does it again. The men's 100 meter final at the 1988 Seoul Olympics is one of the biggest moments in Canadian history. Everyone remembers Ben Johnson crossing the line in 9.79 seconds. But there's one thing that a lot of people don't remember. There was another Canadian in that race and his name was Desi Williams and he grew up right here in this East York neighborhood. In lane seven, number 181, Desi Williams, Canada. He got here back in the 70s. And you know, a kid from the West Indies, yeah. you know, where you never really experienced any kind of cold weather. And to come here, you know, December 28th was tough, man. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a major adjustment for us, right in the heart of winter. And <laughs> not just an adjustment in terms of, of the weather, you know, it was just that major adjustment in terms of trying to fit in into a different society, different yeah. culture. Yeah. You know, but as you can see, over time, you know, we've adapted well. And uh, here we are today. That's the house, man. That's the, that's the apartment. It was 80 yeah. or was it 100? It was this 80. 80. Oh, seriously, it was 80. Huh? 80 gallon, yeah. Right here. That's what it was, man. Right there. What floor was it? Second floor. Uh huh. And uh, I mean, we moved here, and my uncle lived just around the corner. So, like, if we were in, uh, I think it was 201, my uncle was at 202. Mm -hmm. And there was four of us that moved here. You know, we had a two-bedroom. My uncle had a two-bedroom, so my older brother stayed with my uncle, and myself and my two sisters stayed with mom and dad. Mm -hmm. um, no matter how much we begged our parents and everything else, because when all the the heckling and all the you know racial epithet and stuff like that was pushed on you, you know, we go home and I said, "Mom, why are we here?" Right? But I wanted to prove all those kids and, and stuff like that. They used to tease us and you know call us all kinds of names, man. You know, I wanted to prove them wrong that. Mm -hmm. This young kid could be something special, mm -hmm. so that was my drive, that was my motivation. Yeah. You know? We're coming up, coming up on September 24th, and like I said, you might not even realize that it was 25 September years ago. September 24th? Yeah. What's that? Oh, Seoul. Well, yeah, so <laughs> 25 years ago, does it seem like that, that long ago, or does it still seem like yesterday? You know, it feels that long, because for me, it's like, I'm the type of person, after I'm finished with something, I totally forget about it. So. Um, we've moved on and that's it. I wanted to get back into sport to give something back that I got out of it. And I'm fortunate enough to be back in it right now and giving back and coaching and seeing some of the young athletes and stuff like that excel and go up to Worlds and go to the Olympic Games, be finalist and, and medalist and so forth. That's my goal, that's the passion that I have right now. Not for me to compete or do anything you know, physical, but to see the athletes compete and get good results in Canada, that's, that's what it's all about. Today, it's come 360. Started here, go all the way through as a kid, grown up, be at the Olympic Games, be at the pinnacle of sport. 40 something years later, I'm back right where I started, right where when I first came to Canada. No more than what? 100 meters, and that was my specialty, 100 meters. <laughs> 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 
punching. But moment of truth in here, I don't remember where I was in 88 because I was only five months old when it happened. But what were you doing? Hey, I was only a year older than you, so I was just one, learning how to walk, learning how to talk, <laughs> just fighting with my three other siblings like uh, every yeah. day. Fair, fair. But hey, speaking of fighting, the NHL has dropped the hammer on Toronto Maple Leaf David Clarkson in response to the melee Sunday night. Clarkson received an automatic 10-game suspension for leaving the bench, and Phil Kessel is awaiting word on whether he will be suspended for his role in the fight as well. Suspensions will begin when the Leafs open their regular season on October 1st. After the break, we've got a little bit of rugby. Rugby for a good reason. And we hit the water to check the Westwood Sailing Club. Have you ever wanted to work in the sports media industry? Centennial College offers a post-grad sports journalism program that will give you the skills and guidance needed to start your own career in sports media. Centennial College provides students with the opportunity to work in real-life newsroom, radio, and television studio environments. Turn your passion into a sports career today. Check out centennialcollege.ca for more details. Welcome back, everyone. If you're just tuning in, I'm Vinay Raimundo, this is Isaac Wusu, and this is Centennial Sports TV. Hey, Isaac. What's up? You're a big dude. Yes, I am. Did you play a lot of sports growing up, college, high school? Um, yeah, I did a lot of sports, but I took football the most serious. I played at university, actually. Mm. Uh, the one thing with that, though, was I didn't want to get hit, so let's not talk about that. <laughs> On another note, local charity Gainline Africa has hosted its annual fundraising event. The organization supports the youth and the community development through after-school rugby programs in Uganda. On Sunday, field reporter Morgan Gibbons was at Bami Beach to catch one of the biggest events of the year. In three years, Gameline Africa's Rugby Sevens tournament has grown from a small initiative to a prominent community event, hosting 12 teams and over 150 participants. We spoke to the founder about the effect that rugby has had on the developing community. Rugby, in particular in northern Uganda, is, is a way of, a, of utilizing a safe space. Everyone's equal and everyone has to work together, so the ideas of teamwork, leadership, uh, commitment to one another, and uh, understanding, the learning of rules, and, uh, and those sorts of things are all really beneficial to the learning process if put in a very uh, uh, non-competitive uh, environment, and that's what we try to do. Rugby enthusiasts of all skill levels were welcome to participate in the friendly tournament. Board executive Brittany Cheeseman discussed the goals of the event. This tournament is a massive one, so we really want to get out to the rugby community so we can kind of build relationships between the Canadian rugby community and the Ugandan rugby community. So we have a great turnout today. We're hoping to raise about $10,000. So it's a pretty ambitious goal, so we'll see how we go, but it's looking pretty good at this point. Returning participants have watched the expansion of the fundraiser since its inception. This tournament's definitely gotten bigger, there's definitely a lot more teams, a lot more women's teams have been coming out since, once they've kind of realized it's not just, it's not full contact seven sort of thing. This is getting a lot more fundraising every year, so all of it's going, like it's 100% like they said, going to northern Uganda, so it's a great cause and they're doing a lot of good stuff with it, so it's worth it. Gameline Africa is an entirely volunteer-run organization that relies on the support of the rugby community all across Canada. So right now it's been like the Canadian rugby community that's really been generating all the funds for us. Uh, and that's anything from different rugby clubs to different uh, university rugby teams across Canada. It's just really important to know that it's, we're not just building rugby in Northern Uganda, we're building like a community and we're building a family of people that come together and learn how to cooperate with each other to do things for their community. They have recently received their charitable status and with the success of today's tournament, it is clear that the program will continue to grow and support African and Canadian rugby communities alike. 
For Centennial Sports TV, I'm Morgan Gibbons. The tournament was a success as it raised $6,000 for Gayline Africa, and they plan to have their next event in April 2014. Now we switch back to discuss a matter which is a little bit less charitable, hockey fighting. We have reporter Sarah Zintel here with us to discuss what she gets from the pulse of the East York community. Sarah, thanks for joining us. Oh, happy to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, much was made about the Leaf Sabres brawl that closed out Sunday's game. Did you gather that fans and parents in the community were concerned about that kind of influence that young hockey viewers get from seeing that? Yeah, I had the opportunity to go out in the community and speak to young hockey fans and their parents. The overall consensus was that the fight on Sunday was unnecessary. They were also concerned that the young hockey fans who are watching these programs, who are so easily influenced, are watching their role models believe, behave in such a violent manner. Mm -hmm. And we understand that you spoke with Tim McCutcheon, president of Leaside Hockey Association. What were his thoughts on this? Yeah, well, he watched the brawl on Sunday with his 12-year-old son and said he wasn't overly concerned about the, his effects on him. But he said it's a responsibility of parents and coaches alike to just reiterate the importance that educating young fans about how ridiculous it is and how it doesn't represent what hockey's all about. And it's important to preach what respecting your opponents is all about. Hopefully the repercussions that the pro hockey players are going to experience will reiterate those mes messages. Well, Sarah, thank you for being here with us. We really appreciate having you on here. Thanks so much, guys. And now on to a unique sports league in the East York community. Our own Sasha Kaura came to Cosburn Park to profile the only LGBT pro, uh, friendly lawn bowling leagues in the world. It's a beautiful day in East York and we are here today to give you a look at a sport that you might not know too much about. It's lawn bowling, it's fun, and it sure is popular. Actually, curl. We were just like, you know what? Uh, I've always wanted to try lawn bowling. It's like a little secret kind of like. And she was like, yeah, me too. That summer, we just started asking around uh, various clubs, and uh, we chose Cosburn Park. But because we approached a number of clubs, and because since we are an LGBT club, um, some clubs weren't comfortable with that actually. Uh, but Cosburn Park, it is a city-run club, so it's open to everybody and uh, they were actually very accommodating to us and very welcoming. Uh, this is actually my second week. Uh, I just had a couple of friends that were doing it from curling previously and they asked me to come out and just play as an extra for a week and it's been a good time so far. There's a good camaraderie to it, so it's a little bit of physical activity but it doesn't wear you out at the end of the day. You can go out for drinks with everybody after and it's a good social thing to do. It's really good what they do. They've really added a lot to our club. Um, they participate in our jitneys that we have on long weekends, which is, you know, like everybody in the club comes out. It's just a great way to meet people in general. I find that uh, versus going out to a bar versus, you know, going out to a friend's house to drink, you actually sit around and have a, a sober conversation with a gay person for once, which is kind of a rarity in life. Yeah, it is. A, it is does feel very special. We actually we, got, we get a lot of new members coming out every year, so it's opening it up to uh, you know a whole new uh, world of people. The Toronto Rainbowers are always accepting new members, so be sure to check out their website for more information. From Cosburn Park, I'm Sasha Kara, Centennial Sports TV, Toronto. Even as the temperature drops, you can still expect to see boats on the water. Some of fun and some for competition. Reporter Paul Magahi got a close look at just how fun the water can be at this time of year. The fall series kicked off this week, bringing together East End sailing clubs. This event began in 1973 and was designed to promote weekend competition. Hosted by Westwood Sailing Club on Sunday, the regatta consisted of two races and 19 entries. It was a cool and windy day on Lake Ontario, but by race time, the sun started to shine through. Tai Hang, a member of Westwood, acted as the official race officer. Despite being an experienced sailor, setting the course proved to be challenging due to the strong north winds. The winds were shifting back and forth, 30 degrees on either side of our ideal course. It turned out okay for the starts, but the commander still had to um, deal with the, the wind shifts back and forth. The Westwood Sailing Club is accessible and open to the general public, but to compete in the race, you first have to demonstrate an ability to take the helm or act as a member of the crew. For just over $500, a membership gives you use of the clubhouse and access to the boats. 
Although it's more laid back and draws fewer participants than in the summer, the fall series provides fun and healthy competition for devoted sailors. After winning the first race, Paul Clifford and Roger Martin were on the way to collecting their second trophy of the day until a costly mistake turned things upside down. A crowded turn and less than ideal conditions led to the unexpected mishap. We had to give room to a boat that had just creeped inside us. I hadn't given enough room so I, I overcorrected and that, that caused us to dump. He and Martin were clearly annoyed with the mistake but showed resiliency in the end. I, I can't say out loud what was going through my mind. <laughs> I was just very pissed off with myself. Well, we were determined not to be last, so we completed the race without coming in last. Count Brock Monroe among the competitors hoping to win each week. On the water, friends become adversaries trying to gain an extra boat length, but on land, everyone returns to even keel. chance of removing yourself from the daily grind and uh, uh, going out for three or four hours and enjoying the afternoon and some sun and wind and Forget about all your problems, share the experience with a partner, and uh, it's quite enjoyable. So, Vinny, are we going to see you selling the seas too? <laughs> no way. I don't even know how to swim, so I'm not even going to bother. <laughs> that makes two of us. <laughs> I guess we need swimming lessons. But for now, we'd like to thank you for watching the show. Have a good night. Thank you so much.